Good afternoon and welcome. I wait for the door to close. That's my signal. <laughs> so uh, what a great, great uh, reception, great full room. Um, welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Roger Mark D'Souza. I direct our programs on global sustainability and resilience uh, here at the center. And I know many of you are familiar with the center. We serve as the living memorial to President Wilson. And we're particularly pleased that we're able to host together with George Mason University a series called Managing Our Planet. Some of you have been uh, to these series uh, before, which we do in collaboration with our, our colleague and partner, Tom Lovejoy, who will tell you a little bit more in, in a second. Um, the Wilson Center was recently voted by the University of Pennsylvania in the think tank ratings as the number one think tank globally looking at transdisciplinary research. And we're excited about that because a lot of the programming that we do is specifically looking at how we engage across different sectors. And I think the topic that we are looking at here really takes us across a few sectors and really um, allows us to have a sense of what is, what is the evidence. So assessing the evidence, family planning as a contributor to environmental sustainability. And this um, is one that's framed very much in the context of of integration and I had a very interesting meeting late last week I was meeting with someone who works on water issues wash issues and he's a lobbyist spends a lot of time on the hill and we were talking exclusively about water issues but he sort of slipped in to our discussion the the following and he said to me Roger Mark any time that I go on the hill and I talk about integration they immediately think that that's about family planning and then the question is, what's the evidence? What do we know and how, how do these issues relate? So I'm pleased that we're able to talk uh, about this um, particular topic today. And we'll be, it, the session will be moderated by um, Tom Lovejoy. So I'm gonna hand it over to Tom and thank you and welcome. Great, well, th thank you all for being here. Um, the, the Managing Our Planet seminar series of which this uh, is a session <clears throat> was basically built around the notion that there are truly global scale environmental challenges and they need to be dealt with uh, by thinking of solutions at the same scale. And you can't think about any of that without thinking about population, family planning, and environmental quality. So we're smack in what this seminar series is all about. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the, the bios of our speakers uh, because one of the great things about the Woodrow Wilson Center is it gives you the bios. Uh, and our view is that you're here to hear those speakers, uh, not so much to hear about their trajectory. Uh, but I will just, as a preface here, say that uh, Bob Engelman has this long-earned reputation of looking at complex topics uh, like the one in the report being discussed today uh, and doing it in a very thorough and thoughtful uh, and objective fashion. So when, when an Engelman report is about to appear, it is not surprising that just before the 4th of July, we have filled up this room. <laughs> so Bob is gonna talk for about 25 minutes and then uh, each of our other two speakers will speak for 10 to 12, maybe, 12, 10 to 12 minutes. Then we'll open it up uh, and do our very best to be on time for the reception at five o'clock. So okay, Bob. Thanks. Can you hand me the, uh, the clicker there? Clicker. And I hope and assume that works on the... So thank you, Tom, and thank you, Roger, Mark, um, and all your colleagues here at the Environmental Change and Security Program. I don't think it's often enough said from the front of the room how incredibly valuable and important the ECSP program has been over the years in nurturing and nourishing the community of people who, many of whom are gathered here today, that do exactly the kind of work we've been talking about. And, um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be a recipient of their hospitality, I think about six times now over the last 
22 years, and so I'm very grateful to be here as well. Um, I'm also very grateful and more than a bit daunted uh, to have a session and be at a session moderated by Tom Lovejoy. He didn't give my bio, but I have to give a little bit of his in case there's anybody who isn't aware that this is the biologist who introduced the idea of biological diversity to the scientific community in 1980 in the introduction to a, a text on conservation by Michael Soule and Bruce Wilcox and has been promoting that idea and been pioneering that idea through in part what I think must be about the longest running ecological uh, experiment um, in history in the world. Second, okay, I stand corrected, uh, in the Amazon uh, some 50 years or, or more. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> about, a, about two centuries, about two centuries Tom's been working in this area. So we actually have a, um, a section on biodiversity in this report that we're, we're launching here today. But I'm not going to talk about it because it would just be just too painful to be corrected on a fundamental principle of biological diversity <laughs> by Tom while live on the World Wide Web. So um, uh, if anyone wants to ask, maybe I'll take a chance later on. Um, but I do want to say, speaking of the World Wide Web, let's see if I can figure this out. Is it at the top button? Oh, no, it's not the top button, obviously. It's the right, there we go, okay, good. Um, that this report actually is now just recently, thanks to my colleague uh, Gail Gorman, uh, available on two websites now online, the World Watch Institute's uh, website, uh, www.worldwatch.org, and FAPESA.net. FAPESA stands for the Family Planning and Environmental uh, Sustainability Assessment. That's the name of our project. And I actually recommend, we did bring a lot of copies because we wanted to release it here today as a print version, and we think it's a pretty lovely report, and I'm happy to have people have it and look through it. But I actually do recommend that you go to the uh, web-based version because it is rich with hyperlinks that lead directly to the research that we are, uh, that we're, we're looking at in, in the report. There's something like uh, um, 250, I haven't actually counted, we're trying to be qu quantitative as possible, but this is really a guess, uh, hyperlinks directly to scientific reports or navigating you around the report. Um, so I do want to recommend that. This is really the story of a science project that grew. It started in 2013 uh, with a conversation among various funders uh, and uh, CEOs of environmental organizations, of which I was one at the, at the time, kind of lamenting the fact that family planning had fallen off the radar screen of people in the environmental community who used to be influential in promoting U.S. government support for international family planning assistance and for family planning access and sexual and reproductive health and rights generally. Environmentalists and environmental groups like the Sierra Club and others played an important role in that in the 1990s and it, it was no longer quite on people's radar screen and someone had the made the mistake of speaking up and saying, you know, environmentalists appreciate an evidence base. They, they, they tend to, like Tom, work with and from science and contribute to science themselves and they might want to see what the actual evidence base is and one of the donors who probably, funders who probably should be remained name, unnamed, uh, Tim Worth, um, said, right, Engelman, um, you got to go for it. And we started with a modest grant from the UN Foundation as part of the Universal Access Project, which is a, a wide-ranging um, program the universe, or that uh, the United Nations Foundation has to, to work on improving access to, to, uh, uh, to family planning. And right from the beginning, we felt at World Watch, and I felt strongly, that this ought to be a collaboration, that in order to really make more of an impact with the evidence that we could find, whatever the, that evidence was, it would be far better if we could organize a group of people that were more representative of the world's population uh, than we were ourselves. And um, that meant that we were working to collaborate with people, which is something that itself takes a lot of time and effort. We initially worked with two African think tanks to partner with them. We had some great ideas for what to do specifically in Africa, but we couldn't get them funded. Uh, so ultimately, what we did is we assembled a group of about two dozen, uh, some um, uh, researchers, NGO activists, and others from around the world, really representative of every region of the world, Asia, Latin America, and uh, Africa, as well as Europe and North America. Uh, this is just a sampling. I think you might notice that number seven is sitting right next to me, Alaka Basu, who is one of our, uh, the members of our team 
And we also had a group of consultants who worked on it. I'm pleased that Yanena Terefe, I don't know where he is, my colleague on this work, um, he was here. Uh, there he is, thanks, good to see you again, um, was, was very much involved. And c collectively together what we did is we decided to go for basically peer-reviewed research that had been published in the last 10 years. That seemed roughly recent. The, the work went on long enough, it's 2016 now, that it became about 12 years. But the idea of peer review was that this was sub, sort of the gold standard of what science has to say. Now there are, the comments have been made and we might discuss them today about whether field research and some of the gray literature and informal literature that's produced by government agencies, World Bank and others, should qualify as well. But we had so much to work with, we thought, let's go, particularly as a former reporter, I was aware that in this day and age, if something isn't in a peer-reviewed journal, it's very difficult to make news unless it comes out of the White House or some really prestigious report. So we wanted to um, sort of go for the top material. We also knew that we lacked the capacity as a small group of people to really assess methodologies, whether people really knew what they were talking about. So peer review, as faulty as it can be, and we all know that peer review is anything but perfect, um, was at least a, 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 st a good standard to, to go by. Um, we had two hypotheses, and in a sense they were both equally important. We wanted to actually, and, and they mirrored the process that we were engaged in, we wanted to see if we could find a scientific basis for saying that family planning, not, not population per se, but family planning itself was beneficial to the environment and promoted, promoted environmental sustainability. So we began with that as one hypothesis. But we also wanted to do a collaborative work that would demonstrate an effect to the world, would model the way we hoped the world could take these sets of issues on by involving people of both genders, both sexes, both all ages, and people from all over the world. And so we also wanted to demonstrate that there was a diversity of interest in, in, in these issues. Um, and so we took both of these sort of separately. The primary one that I'll be mostly referring to, especially for a lack of time, which is moving quite rapidly, is, uh, is the actual idea of demonstrating that there is this connection. And we started with a set of values principles. This was very important, particularly for the Universal Access Project, which assembles a very diverse group of organizations who are all united in their commitment to sexual and reproductive health and rights that we felt that we weren't interested, that we, we were going to have trouble if we found research that undermined the idea uh, that sexual and reproductive health and rights are the basis and in fact the only basis through which uh, family planning could be beneficial and through which we should act on, on family planning. And fortunately for us and relieving to us was the finding, one of the, one of the impor important findings from our study which uh, ultimately involved 939 papers, there wasn't one that suggested that either population was such an urgent issue or so demonstrably at, at the root of all environmental problems that it had to be dealt with on a crisis basis. Uh, there wasn't one that undermined the, the basic, the rights framework of this. Now, the reality is, out of those 939 papers, we didn't find a single one, not one, that tested our hypothesis. It's kind of a problem. There's no sub-discipline in this area. There isn't a sub-discipline that looks at family planning as something that might help the environment. Disappointing, but it wasn't a surprise to us. We kind of knew that was the way it was anyway. And in fact, no papers actually tested our hypothesis or let alone came close to answering it. So we knew that was going to be the case, and we constructed what we hoped would be a fairly simple, it's not totally simple, but better than some I've seen, conceptual framework that tried to puzzle out how family planning might contribute to environmental sustainability. And one of the paths, obviously, and represented by these arrows at the top, was through reducing fertility, slowing population growth, and relieving pressure, if we could demonstrate that on the environment. But the other that we were also quite interested in was whether, s independently of any demographic effects, family planning would in, in fact empower people, particularly women, who are the only ones who get pregnant in this world and give birth, to somehow become more, have more opportunities in their lives and through those opportunities actually contribute to the environment in their own way. And we tested both of these. And then we wanted, uh, we wanted falsifiability. We knew that, <laughs> I'm on record on this, I have a book called I wrote a book several years ago 
Mexico called More Population Nature and What Women Want, basically making the case that family planning was good for the environment and contraception was something that women have always wanted to be able to use throughout history. So we needed to be careful about how we treated this. This is advocacy-oriented research, which I've been involved in for quite a number of years. We wanted to bend over backwards and make sure we were open to the ideas that would undermine our hypothesis or show where the faults were. And one of the main ones we tested, and I'll say a little bit about it in a second, was this confounding effect that reducing fertility might actually increase per capita consumption. And I should point out that if you look at the definition of family planning, we're talking about voluntary family planning. It's client-focused, multiple method options, informed consent, a number of tests that this is up to the highest standards of our values. Environmental sustainability, we set a very high bar. Net zero emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, background extinction rates, et cetera. That's obviously a stretch, uh, but we wanted to see what we could find in that. Uh, you're not intended to read some of these, um, but this was the form that we sent. Once we made the selection, we used Web of Science and interviews and various methods for determining what papers might have the search terms and be relevant to what we are looking at to make the first cut of 939 papers. We didn't send out all of them for assessment, not by any stretch. Uh, Yan and I and our consultants worked together to go through the abstracts of these to see what was most likely relevant and what wasn't. And the ones we sent out, we had a survey form for our assessors to fill out. Alaka did several herself. Um, basically on the basis of, is it reproducible, is it, is it compelling, is it believable, um, is, does the data and the methodology make sense, things of that kind. So what we ended up with was a division from the papers that most of them didn't make the cut. Most of them, when you really looked at them in some detail, weren't really that relevant to our hypothesis. Um, a total of 414 were either certainly relevant or probably relevant. We had a scoring basis to make this as quantitative as possible. And we ultimately, and this is one of the frustrating things, with a small staff, and you'd think with two and a half years it'd be enough time, but it wasn't enough time to explore the, the large number of probably relevant papers in much detail. That's 302. The 112 we took, and a number of those we did assess collaboratively, and 50 of them are included in this report. And I have to say that in some ways more important than what we found in the report itself is the annotations that we included. They were so rich, even though we didn't find an ironclad case that we could point to that would convince neutral observers or skeptics, which was our standard, that investments in family planning were clear productive investments in environmental sustainability. The diversity and the richness of the papers, I think, speaks for itself. I hope I can get time to say a little bit about a few of them that were exciting, but all 50, I think, in here are exciting. So I encourage you to just leaf through them and see where your eye lights and look at them, and each of them is attached to a hyperlink to the abstract on the web. In many cases, they're open access to the full paper. So we ultimately selected 112. We hope ultimately to, uh, to annotate all of them, but 50 of them are included in this report. One of the things we felt that we did confirm uh, quite comfortably was our second hypothesis. There is a diversity of people interested in this topic. We looked at, number one, you saw our, our, um, a selection of our assessment network, which was primarily made up of people from developing countries who at least were born in developing countries and was pretty well balanced between men and women. That was one test. The other test was looking at the authors. We tried to see what we could determine about authors. We couldn't always tell what sex they were. Chinese names are particularly difficult. We didn't have the resources to Google everybody. But there was a fairly high proportion among the authors of the top-ranked papers that we saw who were, in fact, women, which was of interest to us. So the interest of women and the contribution of women in papers about that related to our conceptual framework was encouraging. And although we weren't able to quantify developing country authors, it was somewhat similar based on what we were able to see and fairly consistent among all the categories that a third or um, maybe not quite a third, maybe uh, tw 30, 25, 30 percent were from developing countries. So we felt pretty good about that. Now let me talk about a, f a few of the findings. Um, probably not surprising to us or to many of you, in the scientific literature that's been peer-reviewed, far more papers dealt with the impact of population growth on various aspects of the environment um, than women's empowerment. But one of the things that we wanted to establish first, and there's a certain duh factor, we call it, in, in some of this. A lot of the people, the experts we interviewed, and we, expert, we interviewed a number of experts as part of the project, said one reason there isn't more work done on this is it's kind of, some of the aspects of it are very, very obvious. 
Well, we believe that having a scientific basis, even for the obvious things, made sense. So one of the first things that we tried to establish was that, in fact, the use of family planning does prevent unintended pregnancy, and there are impacts and benefits of prevention of unintended pregnancy that go beyond the obviously most important direct ones to the individuals who don't become pregnant when they don't want to become pregnant. And in that sense, we did find abundant literature making clear that it reduces fertility as well as being good for people generally. We weren't just looking at developing countries, we were looking at the United States and developed countries as well. And this was a particularly encouraging one showing that as a result mostly of using long-acting reversible contraception or increases in those kinds of contraception in the United States, unintended pregnancies have gone down in recent years. Still quite high, but they've gone down. An interesting one we found that w actually, we were looking really for creative connections between family planning and the environment. And this is a particularly interesting one uh, that looked at the relationship of land and scarcity of land to fertility and the use of contraception and the interest in using contraception. And what the authors found is that when land was scarce in Africa, it didn't have much effect on fertility. A lot of researchers would have stopped right there. But they then went further to see if they could determine what the impact was on demand for, for contraception, or that is unmet demand for contraception, and found that in fact that they were inversely related. As land got scarce, unmet demand for contraception got higher. So in fact, the reality was people were wanting to use contraception. It wasn't available. It's an interesting connection between the environment and, uh, and the use of family planning. A number of authors we found simply asserted that population growth matters to the environment. Interesting uh, phenomenon. Scientists themselves seem to be more convinced than the general public that population growth is a problem for future resource availability and the environment. And yet they don't necessarily back that up, even though they're scientists, with a kind of empirical demonstration of what's going on and why that's the case and how exactly it operates. I found this fascinating. We didn't know quite what to do with it. But you hear, you get a lot of abstracts. I just have two of them here that start with the assumption we all know that population growth harms the environment. And then there's no further discussion of that. But we did find quite a few. I'm going to try to rush through a few. I, I'm putting these up not so much because I expect anybody's going to be reading these beyond perhaps beyond the title, but I actually fell in love with, uh, I've, I've been a science reporter and I've liked it for a long time. It's an odd avocation, but I really enjoy reading scientific papers the way some people like to read poetry or maybe tweets, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you learn a lot from just kind of throwing the abstract and the title of a scientific paper on a screen and learning how to kind of glean what are some of the key messages. This was an interesting one that looked at European population and CO2 emissions, rarely done, and found that new entrants to the European Union were much, there was a much more direct connection than older entrants who had the potential to become more efficient and to offset the impacts of their population increase. Um, I don't know what they would have said about Brexit. I think it came before that. So, um, Probably the best of all is one of the most famous work that Brian O'Neill and colleagues, including a couple from developing countries, have done looking at future population growth and its effect on emissions. And what they find is that when you look at the likely emissions path from fairly sophisticated models that include economic growth, aging, urbanization, that they look pretty much like population projections. So that low population projection for the world is likely to have far lower emissions than the high projection, or in their case, the medium. And that, in fact, it's about the equivalent of ending deforestation to go for the lower path. Uh, this was a second one they did in The Lancet, where they had similar kinds of projections low, medium, high, and you can see that it's very similar to what population growth is itself. But it isn't just people in developed countries. Again, we found a number of papers by people in developing countries. In fact, interestingly enough, Africans were more likely than any other regional group, including Europeans or North Americans, to do this kind of work. This is a woman at Delta State University in Nigeria who looked at Nigeria's contribution from a population perspective to both emissions and how population affected resilience in Nigeria to climate change and called for family planning. Nine out of the 22 papers in our top ranked group that connected family planning directly to environmental benefits in some way and called for family planning were by African authors. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, one thing we found was that it, interestingly, a number of authors decided to quantify the difference in population growth and its contribution to future water scarcity, and in some cases land degradation, versus climate change. And every group that did that found population growth to be the, have the greater impact. 
not that surprising when you understand the, the likelihood that population projections will come true versus the uncertainty that surrounds how climate change will play out in water. But this is something that's missed not only in the news media, but among scientists themselves who typically say climate change is going to drive water scarcity in the future. That's not what the scientists said in the peer-reviewed literature. What they said is that climate change will exacerbate the problems that increasing human demand will place on water. And one group in China actually measured the rainfall over the headwaters of a river system and found it had increased, and yet it was scarce down further down, saying, you know, there's really no other explanation from that other than, than, uh, than population growth. Um, we did verify our little middle box that undermined our thesis here. I'm going to have to be, let this be a proxy sort of for a, 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 f a number of things we found that did undermine our, our thesis, which is that it does seem there's some evidence that lowering fertility increases per capita consumption. So you need to sort of overwhelm that with other benefits of family planning for that not to be a problem. Interestingly enough, we did find some material suggesting that women's status wasn't as much material as population, but that separate from, from population change altogether, improving women's status had its own direct environmental benefits. This is a study that found that where, where women had higher status in countries, when you controlled for everything else, income, GDP growth, urbanization, et cetera, there were actually lower per capita emissions. And they gave an interesting case study comparing Norway to Singapore. Similar economic development, very different status for women. Um, we did find a number of reports along those lines that were fascinating, which I go into more detail, but I better, better move on. I want to end, because my time is running out, um, by going back to this diversity issue and looking particularly at the problem that researchers themselves face in doing this work. One of the conclusions we made is that it is, in fact, difficult to come to any particular strong conclusions about these issues because of barriers researchers themselves face in taking on this work. It's not well funded. Uh, there's in, in educational institutions, there's a certain hesitancy about it. I, I don't think I need to belabor the sensitivity of these issues, although we can discuss it uh, later if, we, if there's time. Um, but interestingly enough, it often is the case that researchers find peer pressure not to look particularly at family planning and population in connection to the environment. Ken Weiss, a good friend and colleague who's been involved in this work himself and is um, a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, was a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter with the Los Angeles Times, interviewed three fairly young researchers from developing country backgrounds who had each done pioneering work in this area. I wish I could describe each of the pieces of research. Camilla Moore, particularly working on biological diversity, uh, and Usman Khan from Pakistan working on the effects of the use of contraception, oral contraception, on estrogen pollution. And, f and uh, Indola Prato, who some of you may know, a wonderful woman who's a physician from Angola. And each of them said, you know, the biggest problem we face in doing our research is that our own colleagues tell us, you can't really do this. You can't really work on this issue. It's way too sensitive. Well, these were people from developing countries who, and a one, in one case a woman, who were able to, in effect, say, wait a second. If it's such a sensitive issue, I'm from a developing country, and I find it meaningful and relevant and interesting, and I want to work on it. And we're eventually able to bring their colleagues along. In Camilla's case, 55 of them ultimately signed on to a, a paper on biodiversity that called for improving, uh, ac well, actually didn't call for improving access to family planning. It, it called for addressing population growth. Um, so this, uh, the convinced them to say it is just a quote from Andola who said, you know, scientists get that population growth matters to the environment. What I have to do is convince them to say it because there's such a silence about this. And that inhibits this research. Even beyond scientists, this is from our, our own new security beat here at, uh, at ECSB, um, SP, the, uh, there, there was an interesting paper done in Studies in Family Planning by Teresa Hoke. I haven't been able to talk much about popula population health and environment projects, which we did look for research on and found some interesting research on. Perhaps we can talk about that in the, uh, in the discussion. But it was an interesting group of, f of workers in the Greenbelt Movement, wa the late Wangari Matai's organization, who were working on population health and environment by promoting family planning while they were teaching people to plant trees, and interviewed them about why they were doing this work. And I found that this, I found this just a fascinating thing. R irrespective of whether you're a scientist, you know, a member of AAAS, or if you're a functionally literate volunteer for the Greenbelt Movement, there's a certain wisdom that people seem to see that family planning is valuable in part, at least in large part, as these people said, 
uh, in their focus groups because they can see directly that it's helping to, to relieve the pressure that is otherwise growing on natural resources. And I think in, in sort of summing up what we can say we found in this study, and as I say, I'm not sure the findings are actually as important as the research itself, and I urge you to go to that, and we, we hope um, and intend to uh, continue our work to make more public the best of the research that we found in these papers. Um, but one of the key findings is that there's, even though there is not an ironclad case that could convince everyone in this room, or even if you're friendly in this room, everyone in Washington, that, uh, that family planning is an absolutely critical investment for environmental sustainability. There is abundant support for that idea and very, very little refuting it. We really found a very, there was nothing, there wasn't a paper that, for example, even hypothesized, let alone demonstrated that family planning was harmful to the environment or that it was irrelevant. The most we came up with was it's not as big a deal as some people think and we have some of those papers and annotated them. But it is important and it, it's, it's, it's incredible that at this time when environmental problems are as urgent as they are, when we have something that in all probability does make a contribution through benefiting individuals and enabling them to realize their own reproductive intentions, that then has benefits that ripple out for the good of all humanity, indeed for the planet. I think that we're called in our moment in history to work on this issue. And I'm hoping that this report will help demonstrate the scientific basis that will enable us to see that it makes sense to do that. Thank you. So our, our next speaker is Alaka Basu, a fellow, uh, senior fellow at the UN Foundation and also a faculty member at Cornell. Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Close. Oh. Okay. So I'm. I'm not going to comment really on this. It is a magnificent report, except to tell you to flip through it, even if you can't read it fully or don't uh, aren't in, uh, interested enough to read it fully. And it's a labor of love, of course. I've been watching it with uh, Bob and his dedicated team. But it's also the best review we have so far of the subject of the possible connections between family planning and environmental sustainability. And this is it's remarkable, given that it's such a recent, uh, the interest in the subject is so recent, and how difficult it is really to do this kind of research. I mean, reviewing some of the papers for this project I made me understand how complicated the whole thing is. And so to pull out the connections and make a story is amazing. And so the thing I would say about the report is that while there might not be a smoking gun here, whatever evidence they do find does complement our intuitive sense that population and environmental sustainability uh, are connected. So it's a pity that the word population has gone out of our vocabularies uh, because it's, we, are, we have such a horror of its Malthusian connections that we don't talk about it even when in innocuous ways, for example, in providing us with the changing numbers that we need to work on the SDGs, for example. I mean, we need to keep population dynamics in the background if you're going to make any really practical operational plans about investments and programs to achieve uh, the SDGs. Now, this is not, as we fear, supposed to mean that we therefore impose family planning, but think harder about how we meet unmet need, and as well as probably create a greater demand for voluntary family planning. But anyway, right now I'm not going to talk about the, the, the details of this. What I'm going to do is uh, take it further with uh, two, on two topics, uh, which I think uh, a part of it is empirical, a part of it is my for future research at some point or someone else's. But I want to just uh, take uh, two points from, that follow from this report. And I should add that these two points that I bring up are very much in keeping with a character flaw that I have, which is that my children always complain that I'm too much of a cynic, so too pessimistic. I always look a gift horse in the mouth. I don't believe my luck. When something good happens, I'm always looking at the bad that lies around the corner. So take my comments in that <laughs> spirit, and that's the way I want to make two sets of perverse comments on this larger subject of family planning and environmental sustainability. Both of these are related to some skepticism about win-win representations of the world. Uh, while it's true that life isn't a zero-sum game, 
which I hate to acknowledge. Uh, the point is it's not a laboratory either. So there are always trade-offs to keep in mind, which uh, most of it, many of, of which are positive, which is what a win-win solution is about, but some are negative too. And the way I'm going to talk about these two points is go back to my days as a student of demography and a later researcher in demography and look at some of the old style literature of the 70s and 80s to make these two comments. So the first one is uh, this, uh, the standard long, uh, very simple equation uh, that tried to relate population to uh, an environmental impact, which says that the impact is a function of, of course, population, but also the A and T in that equation, which refer to affluence and to technology. So an affluence meaning uh, is a metaphor for or a stand-in for consumption, that other things being the same, the rich consume more resources than the poor. Though you did mention a couple of studies where it's not so obvious, but I, in fact, would take this uh, uh, further and say that the demand for family planning rises with affluence, so that meeting this demand will not obviously mean that the consequent fall in fertility is exactly matched by a consequent reduced impact on the environment, because while P has come down, A has gone up. But more importantly than that, I think to me, it is that uh, the, there should be, the A actually, rather than affluence, also refer, uh, can be taken to talk, mean aspirations. So we might say that one of the ways that population growth rates or fertility comes down is because uh, even if affluence doesn't rise, aspirations have changed. And so then you, and particularly material aspirations have changed, so that even if total affluence remains unchanged, lower fertility was likely to reach, lead to higher consumption and therefore higher environmental impact. So I would, I change the word uh, A from uh, affluence to aspirations here, but actually more accurately, I probably need to add another A there and say that it's, uh, uh, the impact is a function of population, uh, affluence, aspirations, and technology. And so that is the, the point I'm making here. And uh, so, I, so to me, if we are going to sort of bring the match between uh, I mean, actually have an impact of reduced population growth on the environment, we need to now do something about the second A. Uh, no, uh, by changing it from, uh, well, basically the, uh, what I'm saying is that the second A, the aspirations, too much in our modern world refers to material aspirations. So, so that's where the problem lies, not just an affluence, but the fact that one of the drivers, one of the big drivers, and I have a lot of research on that, of fertility decline in poor countries is a rise in material aspirations. If you have one child less, maybe you can have a second car. If you have a son in particular, or if you have one daughter less, maybe you'll get a dowry when that uh, your son marries someone for who's rich. So there, there is the aspirations part of it, which which is very material, which means which has an environmental impact. So to me, the uh, way to deal, think about this in a very long-term utopian way is really to think about uh, how one can move uh, the, uh, the A, the MA, material aspirations part of this equation to something that I call NMA, non-material aspirations. How one can translate the decline in fertility into, uh, to how one can motivate fertility decline by changing aspirations which have to do with things that don't involve the environmental environment being degraded. Maybe cultivating a useful hobby, developing kinship uh, relationships further. I mean, this is a very, uh, it sounds very fuzzy, but I do have specific ideas in my head that I can't go into now. But I think that's one part of the ideational change that we talk about as a motivation for high fertility, uh, that we, uh, motivation to reduce fertility, that we should be thinking about also as encouraging uh, a change in ideologies and desires for a rise in non-material aspirations that can in turn fuel fertility decline. Okay, so that was the, I'm not going to elaborate now. Let me move on, I can move on to the next point that I want to make, which is a twist on the macro versus micro relationships between population and environmental sustainability. When we're talking about the relationship between population and other aspects of life, health, education, economic growth, poverty reduction, I think we've established quite well that the relationship at the macro level between population size and growth and these outcomes like health, education, et cetera, is paralleled by the relationship at the micro level between family planning use and fertility and these outcomes. 
In other words, just a slower population growth is good for a country because it allows more resources to be diverted into productive investments as well as into improving the human development indicators of its citizens. At the family or micro level to lower fertility does facilitate better maternal and child health for biodemographic reasons as well as due to having greater more resources to invest in each child and improve overall family, economic and social well-being. But in the case of this environmental sustainability outcome, I think there might be a mismatch between macro and micro relationships. So this mismatch is most obvious if we take the next step, which we must, I think, in looking at the impact of environmental disasters or degradation, which is the flip side of environmental sustainability. The other side is, if, you know, if it's not sustainable, you're going to have disasters or degradation. Because, and when these disasters and degradations are caused by rapid population growth or large numbers of people, but the impact when it falls on families, especially women and children, actually uh, falls uh, uh, on the small families, so rather than on the families with fewer children. So what I'm saying is that while high fertility at the micro, uh, at the micro level, and which in turn means high population growth at the macro level, has worrying implications for environmental sustainability, when these implications are actually acted out and we have negative environmental fallouts, at the micro level, the families worst affected are usually the ones with the fewer, fewer household members. Coping with disaster, whether man-made, natural, or random, is much easier for families with what economists call a diversified portfolio. In demography, this term was used in the old academic literature to talk about the buffer that several children provide at such times. So the, and there's anthropological work, for example, from the 70s and 80s on this idea that children serve as an insurance against risk. So as environments get more fragile and more vulnerable with population pr pressure, it is precisely higher fertility that might be a coping or resilience strategy, especially in the absence of other forms of security and insurance, which is usually the case for the poor and poor countries of Africa and Asia. So those poor households that have unilaterally done their bit for the environment by having fewer children, even if, as their neighbors continue to breed, in fact, pay a higher price when the overall fertility, high fertility in a society leads to greater environmental stress. So I would just give you two very quick examples. I'm sure my time is almost up uh, to, uh, of this. One of them is you must have all, or not all, but you must be aware, you must have read in places, including in the Washington Post, about the farmer suicides that are occurring in India because of drought conditions, which is pro partly related I think there is some relationship to climate change and the changing pat weather patterns, but basically farmers, small landowners who've taken loans, uh, uh, which they think they'll pay back when they ha have a good agricultural season, are very often finding that their entire crop has gone because the rains didn't come on time or there was too little rain or they, uh, uh, whatever reason connected with uh, family. I mean, I've been reading some of the literature on the different kinds of climate change impact on water for agriculture. But anyway, the point is that a large number of farmers who then couldn't pay back these loans, thousands of them in Western India have been committing suicide. And what is the impact of that on families that they leave behind? The big impact has been on women who then have to deal with the uh, consequences of not having uh, the man in whose name usually the land is, uh, and, and having this loan to be repaid, and having a bad sea agricultural season. And these are the women who, in fact, then we have not the next step where several of these women have committed suicide. And in fact, the ones who seem uh, to uh, be better able to cope with this calamity are the women who actually have this diversified portfolio of sons who can be sent to the city to work, of daughters who can help in other ways. So at such a time, resilience, in fact, when the, not, no other uh, help is forthcoming, it is your family that you depend on. So the very popular, high fertility and population that is leading to environmental degradation, in turn is making, but the, having the opposite effect of getting the small families less able to deal with the consequences of that degradation. Another small example, uh, deforestation, that's also an important outcome of population growth and environmental impact, means a longer and lo uh, longer trek for fuel to collect fuel wood for many family, poor families. Here again, children are very useful. Here, uh, here, this is typically the work that women and children do. And so the longer the walk, the less the time the woman has to devote to other activities. And again, this is something we have data on, on how much time women, how much extra time women are having to spend as forests are getting depleted.
So my conclusion really is that for the sake of the environment, we must meet the unmet need for family planning that already exists, as well as promote demand. But we need to do this with two other things in mind. One is uh, what I called the idea, promoting further the idea of voluntary simplicity. Apparently, there is a movement for voluntary simplicity in this world. So, but, and secondly, thinking really harder about it being only fair that we also uh, think about um, being more active in providing basic social security and what we call risk insurance to the families that are going to suffer from the impact of population pressure on the environment. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll go right on to Kat as our final contributor to this part of the session. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to the Wilson Center and to World Watch for uh, inviting me to be a <coughs> part of this panel. I am the odd one out here. Um, I am not a researcher in this area. Uh, I actually got my start in, uh, as an undergrad uh, in neurobiology and behavior. And then I went and became a reporter, and I thought, well, okay, there's clearly no connection there. Uh, but now what I do working for resource media uh, is I do a lot of storytelling and helping other people think about storytelling and communications around issues where we want to make a difference. And it turns out that neurobiology and behavior is actually a really good background for this kind of work. So uh, at Resource Media, I helped create and run the Women at the Center project, uh, which tells integrated stories about the connections between reproductive health and rights and sustainability. Stories, a lot less about data and more about stories, which is a big difference between us and the FAPESA project, obviously. Um, but uh, I've got a couple of main points to, to make today, uh, because what we want to do is figure out, given that the evidence base around these links, uh, around this integration, which is so important to all of us, are not as, the, that evidence base is not as robust as we would have hoped, how do we build on that duh factor, as Bob put it? Uh, it's fascinating to me uh, how, how many researchers just assume that there are connections between population dynamics and the environment and sustainability. So how do we build on that? So um, I want to make a couple of points today. And the first one is that data alone is not enough. And the second is that data around these links can actually miss the point. So point number one, data is never, data alone is never enough. Facts are important, but no matter how compelling they are, they are not the way that we create action and decisions and change. You need two more things. You need stories and you need pictures. I'm going to tell you two very short stories. And I want you to think about which one is most compelling to you. Story number one, food shortages in Malawi are affecting more than three million children. In Zambia, severe rainfall deficits have resulted in a 42% drop in maize production. As a result, an estimated three million Zambians face hunger. More than 11 million people in Ethiopia need immediate food assistance. And your donation to save the children will help us save millions of people from these food shortages. So that's story number one. Story number two, any money that you donate will go to Rokia, a seven-year-old girl who lives in Mali. Rokia is desperately poor and faces a threat of severe hunger, even starvation. Her life will be changed for the better as a result of your financial gift. With your support, Save the Children will work with Rokia's family and other members of the community to help feed and educate her and provide her with basic medical care. Now, which one do you think would encourage donors to give to Save the Children? If you said story number two, the data is on your side. This is actually an example from a study by the University of Pennsylvania's Deborah Small and she found that individuals give more to identifiable victims who have an emotional appeal than they do to a faceless statistical group. One is more compelling than millions, and that's the power of story and the power of pictures. <laughs> 
Now here's why story and pictures provoke a response that data alone does not. Around seven years ago, neuroscientists began using brain scanners to better understand how humans make decisions. And before then, it was assumed that decisions were made in a rational part of the brain. Makes sense. But it turns out that the parts of the brain that are activated when you ask people to make decisions are the emotional parts of the brain. We are not making decisions based on data, based on facts, based on rationality. We are making them based on emotions. So if you think about how do we create change in the world, how do we take that duh factor and turn it into policies and actions that make a difference, we need to be appealing to emotions. And data alone doesn't do that. So what will? The bottom line is we have to make people feel more than we make them think. And stories and images are really the way to do that. In fact, images are crucial. Cognitive research also shows us that we are visual first and verbal second. So if I put more words than that on that slide, you wouldn't have heard a word I said because you would be reading them instead of listening. Um, your, what, the, what you're taking in through your eyes always overpowers what you take in through your ears, and what you see has more impact than any words. Pictures are more memorable. They create more of an emotional response than words, but pictures combined with words when they reinforce each other can be even more powerful. I grabbed this from Twitter yesterday uh, from Women for Women UK. That's the photo, and here was the text. Now I grow cabbages and spinach and sell them. I also make dresses, and I've learned how to save and invest wisely. Now if there's a problem, I know I can solve it. Now here's the facts that back this up. The year-long Women for Women International program in Rwanda equips women to earn money, regain their confidence, and actively participate in their communities. On average, women who take part in this program report their daily personal earnings more than double, from 25 cents a day to 67 cents a day at graduation. That fact is compelling, but without this woman's personal story, people won't stop to hear and understand and appreciate that fact. The story and the photo is what makes people pay attention. Now here's my second and final point data alone about the links between family planning and the environment can miss the point. A few years ago, the Hewlett Foundation funded a study of experts and decision makers in the US and a couple of European countries, asking them what they thought about the evidence that carbon emissions can be reduced by reducing population growth rates. That's in the Brian O'Neill paper that Bob mentioned earlier. And in the vast majority of cases, those experts and decision makers said, that's really interesting, but really we should be providing access to family planning because it's the right thing to do. These were people who cared deeply about climate change and reducing carbon emissions. But the facts, and the facts are that at least at the time of the O'Neill paper, one-seventh of the carbon reductions that we need to achieve could be achieved by meeting all unmet need for family planning around the globe. That was a sort of a shrug, a ho-hum moment. But they said, you know, we should really be providing funding for family planning anyway because it's the right thing to do. And Bob makes this case in one of his own uh, perspectives in this report. He says, the use of family planning must always be based on the fundamental right of all individuals and couples to decide for themselves the timing and spacing of pregnancy. Even if some of the scientific evidence that we assess suggests an urgency to slow the growth of population, to ease pressure on natural resources and the environment, and some does, this principle is paramount. Data alone could miss that point. Now, Bob also talked about LA Times reporter Ken Weiss, whose photo I'm borrowing here. If you haven't read his 2012 series, Beyond Seven Billion, it does a fantastic job of telling the stories that illustrate what access to family planning or lack of access to family planning really means to women and families and communities. Uh, this is actually out of a story 
um, from a project, Conservation for Public Health in Uganda, which started asking a question of how do we reduce the uh, loss of gorillas in this national park? And ended with what we really need is to provide family planning and public health services to the communities around that park, which has helped the communities and the gorillas. That's a story. And that's the kind of story that can help people who understand that duh factor about the connections to actually act and make decisions that put better policies into place. Uh, Ken's outlook or perspective um, that, that Bob mentioned, convince them to say it, points out the difficulty that researchers have in talking about these, these connections. And we know why those, that difficulty exists. We know about the history around um, coercive uh, contraception and China's one-child one policy. Um, those are not reasons not to do the research. They are reasons to couple the data with stories that create that emotional response. Um, very quickly, uh, Our Women at the Center project focuses on stories and images and our fundamental principle is that we should be providing universal access to family planning, regardless of the multiple benefits that it provides, because it's the right thing to do. We also point out a lot of good evidence about the connections, and we tell stories about the connections. But our bottom line is, it's the right thing to do. Um, if you are looking for help in finding the right images to tell stories, we have a free report on our website called Seeing is Believing. Um, and there are postcards out on the table if you need to find it online. But all of the cognitive research that I mentioned that leads us to point out that images and story are where we really need to focus in addition to data can be found at that, at that site. I hope we'll check, you out, check it out. Thank you very much. So Bob, I'd like to give you a chance to respond to what you've heard, and then I may pop a question or two, and then we'll open it up to uh, the larger group here. Um, well, I think uh, clearly both, both of my uh, respondents are making good points. I can't say I disagree with the, uh, either of what they're saying. I think there's some nuances that I would probably be somewhat different on. In the, in the area that Alaka was speaking about in relation to fertility decisions that are based on some sort of risk insurance, uh, the evidence we found was, was mixed on this. And I know there's some older evidence, but it's a very, very dynamic world. We were looking just in the last 10 years, and there's, we, we looked at a number of papers that were trying to puzzle out, did the degradation of the environment discourage fertility or encourage fertility? And I mentioned one of them, the Hetty and Jane piece, that suggested it was discouraging fertility, but women weren't able to get access and their partners weren't able to get access to family planning. There was only one study that seemed to show that environmental degradation, in this case in Nepal, particularly relating to fodder scarcity, seemed to in be increasing fertility. Most of the rest of them uh, suggested that environmental degradation had at least some impact on decreasing fertility. And one of the reasons is that the risk benefit of extra children was actually degrading as the environment was degrading. That is, migration is no longer as successful a strategy as it once was. Extra children often come back from the city with, you know, literally their heads bowed, having failed to make it in the city. And it, it more and more people, even in resource-stressed, poor communities and often of low education, are feeling like it makes more sense. And young women, I, I can verify this to some extent anecdotally, from the stories that I've told uh, reporting on this as a reporter and also for Population Action International and I worked for them, younger women particularly will often say, I really want to have fewer children that I can afford to educate. Uh, and that that is often increased rather than decreased. But it varies and it's, it's a dynamic situation we need to look at. Um, I completely salute her comment about voluntary simplicity and, and consumption. I was a founding board member of the Center for New American Dream whose uh, motto was more fun, less stuff. 
which I think was sort of a <laughs> variation to, uh, to what you were saying. <laughs> and we worked on that idea that there were all these, we, we weren't telling people less, we were telling people more. More time with your children, more time in your neighborhood, in your community, more political activity, more connections with human beings is clearly one of the, the steps on consumption we need to take. And I was actually disappointed. Alaka contributed a, a piece relating to the, the research that she's conducting uh, for the report, and I loved it, but she was busy and said it would take too much time to complete I still so. haven't done it. <laughs> but maybe the next edition of the report will have it. Um, CAD is more difficult to, to, uh, to address their concerns. We, we've talked about this uh, a lot, and CAD and I work together on both UAP, UAP partners, and in fact, she's helping uh, the, our, us communicate this report. So we're, we're good friends, and uh, we, ha we have our disagreements to some degree. I think it's a matter of nuance. I don't think, I think, I hope it's obvious to, to you all that I am not claiming that data is all we need and that the research is the only thing we need. Clearly, one needs to have both. I'm, I'm very fond of saying the plural of animals anecdotes of anecdote is data. <laughs> Get two anecdotes and you've got, you've got some data, there are two <laughs> of them. <laughs> and w I also had a friendly disagreement about some of these things with one of our, our, um, our, our FAPESA research assessors and a consultant, Sam Sellers at the University of North Carolina, who has a piece about causation. And he was, he was one, and I love to work with people like this, who always said, don't think this is causal, this is correlations. You know, you can't, correlation is not causation. And my response to that often, and this is probably my own kind of uh, uh, just the way I think, is like, well, when you have enough correlations, you start to get suspicious. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I think it's a mix. I mean, one of the things that concerns me about some of, the, some of the way Kat was expressing that is, yes, there's a lot of truth, certainly with a lot of audiences, and we weren't talking about every audience. Being, needing to get better data. We were specifically talking about environmental thought leaders, but she did raise the issue of policymakers that they respond to emotion, that they respond to feelings and not thinking. Well, I think that's concerning. I think that's one of the reasons that we face some of the really serious problems we face politically right now is that there are a lot of people in the United States and clearly in the United Kingdom who are responding to the way the world is unfolding with feeling rather than thinking about what's going on. And that the best approach is one that I'm happy to say the World Watch Institute has always been very strong on. The best work, the secondary research that we do at World Watch around the, the problems of environmental sustainability, combine data and story to, to make a compelling case that results from going from the macro, the data, the evidence, and then also to the individual stories, which is something I don't think Kat would really disagree with. Uh, so I guess that's what I would say by way of response to those. Very good. So I'd like to ask uh, a couple process questions. Uh, one is, is, is how you made the transition uh, from, from being essentially a newspaper reporter to somebody who relishes reading scientific papers. <laughs> uh, and also, you, you indicated this was a, a very different kind of report and process than anything you'd done before because of the amount of collaboration. And I love your comments on why you did that and what it was like. I'll, I'll be brief so we can get to some of the other speakers and your own questions as well. Um, what well, has it happens, I was a science reporter for many years, so that helped me kind of imbue a love of. Uh, uh, what I love about science is that it, 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 it is trying to figure out reality in some ways. It's like the blind men and the elephant, certainly, um, story I'm sure you all know, but it, it is actually getting at something that uh, ultimately people can come around to some agreement about whether you, you never are sure about all of it. But there's, it's an interesting way to study the way uh, the world works. And I actually came to really enjoy as a reporter covering science and uh, thinking about the implications of science and getting some of the personal stories around the scientists and the impacts of the, of the science um, and things of that kind. And, uh, let me just add one more thought I had while Kat was talking, which was that, you know, I think that climate change is, is, is some evidence that that evidence itself is really important. If 99% of the world's scientists were telling stories about individuals who were suffering from drought instead of doing scientific research that nailed the fact that human beings were causing climate change, I don't think we would have had the Paris Agreement. I don't think we would have had the, the policy changes that we've had so far, so I think that there is some importance to evidence in, in that way. But the other thing that is really important about being a reporter is I actually think that the reporter's method is similar to the scientist's method. That the reporter 
starts out with a kind of a, thinks there's a story somewhere and thinks it's interesting and, and comes up with what amounts to a hypothesis about the story, but then knows that she has the responsibility to, to be balanced and to actually try to falsify the story that she thinks is going to make a headline. She better identify some people who say it's not a story, here's why it's not a story. And it's very simple, similar to the scientific method where a scientist tries to come up with a hypothesis and then says, all right, team, we've got to find out why this hypothesis is wrong, and if we can't do that, we maybe can get a paper published in a peer-reviewed journal. So I found the transition actually, um, I mean, I, th I think I was lucky, I was blessed to get a certain amount of training in holistic thinking as a science environment and health reporter, that when I left reporting, I felt like, great, I think I've got the tools to sort of figure this out and be helpful to it. On the collaboration, as I said early on, I just really felt that one of the problems we face in presenting evidence on this issue and in telling stories on this issue is that it's not a diverse enough choir that we're either singing to or telling the story about. And in my own travels in developing countries, I was always impressed at the number of scholars and individuals and individual women, um, community leaders, who themselves were very willing to talk about family planning's contribution to environmental sustainability and who saw those connections. So I wanted to see if, if we could diversify the group of people talking about it, which meant talk, working in collaboration. And that is, I would say, the biggest reason, aside from my own procrastination in some cases perhaps, that this report took two and a half years to do. It's very hard to work across uh, international boundaries, sometimes across some languages, uh, language differences. and. People needed a certain amount of hand-holding, and people needed to have some sort of agreement. We didn't try to write by committee, but I think, I hope Alok will back me up in this, I tried to share what we were finding, I tried to represent in the report, which mostly I did write myself, would have never worked if all 20-some-odd people who were involved in this had tried to write it together, but tried to share it and get sort of a consensus about our findings. And that worked, but it was very, very time-consuming. Yet it's important to do, I think this process is something that can generate more credibility for integrated research across disciplines uh, by virtue of getting, the, 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 the scientific papers, for example, that often make the most impact is when reporters can say, 55 authors came together and looked at the, the boundaries of our you know, environment or whatever, the great, the famous boundary paper that had, I don't know how many report, uh, authors, something like 40. Um, Camilla Mora's work on biodiversity, 55 authors from all over the world. That's just a much more convincing story than when one person writes one. Um, so I think it's a good way to work. It just is more time consuming and takes a lot more time and effort. Good. So the floor is open for questions. I think, do we have a microphone for people? Uh, and please identify yourselves and ask a question. So uh, I'll let you choose, right? Hello? <laughs> I can't see all of this with the light in my okay, eyes. I, I, okay. Um, my question is for Ms. Um, Baseo. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name right. Um, but in your research, have you found that um, in despite of the fact that the majority of carbon emissions do come from developed countries, um, do you think that there is an argument to be, to be gained um, is there any evidence showing that a significant amount of emissions are maybe projected to come from developing countries? Is that an argument to be made? And identify yourself. Uh, my name is Katrina Semek. I'm with MSI US, Marie Stopes International. Uh, we're an international reproductive health and family planning Great. organization. Thank you. So who wants to take that on? Well, she's asking. Uh, I, I, I don't want to make this a competition between the rich and the poor countries. I think both sides, for in different ways, are to blame. So I think the poor, I mean, if you've been in a traffic jam in Delhi, uh, <laughs> any time of the day, any time of the night, uh, uh, you, you'll know that there's a serious problem there. Uh, so so I, I, and I can say that because I come from there. Uh, it's more difficult here to say this, uh, to acknowledge that the, the poor countries also have a serious role to play. And that is a kind of problem that I don't think can be brushed aside 
as it's of course it's of course by poverty it's not caused by poverty the drought the farmer suicides the other kinds of things that are that exist the deforestation i think i can attribute to poverty here in fact it's a very uh, grasping ambition to be like the west that is doing this and so to that extent i would like the developed world i think to take responsibility for their part of the i don't even know the numbers anymore the several fold more emissions or other kinds of degradation that they're responsible for. And, but I don't want the poor countries to use that as an excuse to say, if them, why not us? So I think we need to take responsibility for our own emissions as well. Great. Hi, uh, John Pielemeyer. I uh, was involved with leading some evaluations of uh, integrated population environment programs in the last century and a little bit later. Uh, and th those programs have been funded by the Packard Foundation and USAID, and they're practical programs trying to improve activities related to family planning and environment in, in the third world. And I think you could expand your evidence base uh, from peer-reviewed academic journals, which I find extremely limited, frankly, uh, to looking at program and project evaluations, which I guess they're peer-reviewed because they're reviewed by project officers and and program officers in all these institutions before they get published and they get critiqued. Uh, but they show that there is a very positive relationship between integrated programs and value added for many of them. Many of those value added, uh, values added had relate to gender related improvements. Um, so examples that you find if anecdotes lead to data uh, are people in, the th in practical project areas find that uh, um, women are more involved in, in environmental activities than they were before the project started. Uh, girls are involved in mangrove planting along with boys, uh, and, they get, and they learn about environmental activities. Women become treasurers of fisheries associations, uh, and when there were no women involved in those associations prior to the programs. And, and on the counter side, you have more men involved in family planning and, and more people carrying out family planning activities. So if you look across the, the now continuing programs of integrated programs pop that have pop and environment together, I think you'll find an evidence base you can add to what you have here. Sort of a Roger Mark point, I think. <laughs> yeah, I thought Roger Mark and I have had this discussion and you're right, peer review is a bit limiting and it's particularly limiting unfortunately in the case of PHE which actually is an area that, that makes cat's point in a lot of ways. They're wonderful stories in population health and environment projects. As it happens, we had our reasons for limiting our work to peer review. This report would have come out in 2019 had we looked at the gray literature. Um, although we still hope to do that, I will say that we did assemble, Yen and I did find a lot of good uh, literature that was not peer-reviewed and we sort of put that aside and said we hope we can get to that. But I do want to say, first of all, I want to say that John Pielemeyer is being too humble. He himself is one of the authors of technically a non-peer-reviewed, although I'm sure it got a fair amount of peer-reviewed uh, work with Laurie Hunter uh, and, and others, um, basically documenting what he just said and did fantastic work ten years ago and I would have liked to included that. But I have to say, in response to you and to Roger Mark, who also makes precisely this point, and it's a good one, that we'd only found a few peer-reviewed uh, papers about population health and the environment pro projects, but those that we found were very compelling. In fact, the one by Leona Dagnus et al. in environmental conservation used tried to do, a, in effect, a double-blind study. It wasn't close, but they, they've got enough data to conclude what you're saying, that the integrated projects did better than projects that were either just family planning or just marine conservation. And others we found, um, uh, Blue Ventures, for example, is a, these are all organizations and people that Roger Marks hosted here at, in this room. Um, there was good evidence that they did uh, valuable work, and um, I there is some material in here on that, so I hope you take a look. Uh, the next grant and the next career uh, will take care of the, uh, the non-peer-reviewed uh, work. That's um, great. If I could say a little something about that, too. I mean, I think that is one of the, um, one of the drawbacks of uh, focusing so so much on the data. Um, I would love to see this report, and, and Bob, you and I should talk about this. How do you how do you make this report even more compelling with some appetizers of story? We often talk about 
the story as being the appetizer that gets people in to eat the dinner. And the dinner is the data, which is really important, but it's really hard to get people to, to devour that if you haven't whetted their appetite with story. So maybe there are ways that we can work together to add some of those non-peer-reviewed stories that get people, the right people, the decision makers who might be in a position to provide more funding for research like this, or the decision makers who are looking at policy changes to actually pay more attention to data like this. That's great. Somewhere on this side of the room, great. Yes, I had a question for Dr. Basu. Um, looking at your equation, I'm thinking of two, two countries, uh, China and Japan, and comparing them. But when you refer to, uh, w because populations are basically stable in both, when you're referring to affluence and technology, are you talking about change in those, or are you talking about steady state, where it is at the time? Uh, well, both, but what I was saying is the way we traditionally think about the impact of numbers on, an env on the environment, we say the number impact of numbers is conditioned by the current state of affluence of that country and the current state of technology, which can, in some sense, either um, exacerbate or, in fact, diminish the uh, bad effects on uh, environment. So it's uh, so it's uh, it's uh, so and also one can talk about it in a dynamic sense that as population numbers change, does affluence change and does technology change? And they all three might move sometimes in tandem, sometimes differently. But at any point of time, the impact of population numbers or population growth rate on the environment is conditioned by these other factors as well. Keeping these other two factors constant, then population has an effect. But if, the, if these, no, these change, then the population impact might change. That's all. So it's not a question of dynamic or static. It's just saying that they all condition uh, the, uh, the, and sometimes cushion, sometimes exacerbate uh, the relationship between population and the environment. Great. This side. If I can just add to that, one of the things that we found in the study is that, that I, the iPad equation has undergone a lot of criticism since it was introduced by Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren in the 70s, 73, I think. And part of it is around that question. What's it actually showing? Don't these things interact? Is it the change? Is it the size? What does it really say beyond a fairly simplistic thing that, yeah, they're all connected? But there's, a, there's an improvement on it called STIRPAT, which stands for stochastic iPad, I believe. And stochastic captures the fact that these things are interrelated and they change with time and they can have multiple properties based on how they change and what size they are initial uh, at their initial point and also the the resilience of the environment itself which ipad doesn't really cover so if you look in the report it's not indexed unfortunately but another good reason to do it online search for stirpat there are two or three really good papers that use stirpat that equation to analyze well one of them was the fuel wood and per capita consumption, one that I pointed out, they use STIRPAT. And I think it is an advance on the more simplistic iPad equation. And they both overlook Yeah, inequality gets extreme. It's mostly about averages. So, uh, I mean, STIRPAT, I think, tries to, to, to integrate some aspects of inequality, but I don't think very, probably very successfully. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. I'm Roger Martin. I'm president of uh, Population Matters, which is an uh, environmental NGO operating in London and trying to achieve exactly what you're trying to achieve. I've just come uh, in the last couple of hours from the um, closing session of the conference you and I attended yesterday, um, the International Society for Ecological Economics, uh, because I take as much interest in the economics of population growth, which are as perverse as their environmental uh, side effects. Um, just to mention that from, from that conference, I happen to have a few copies of a paper that we commissioned from the absolutely opposite end of the scale, not the Rolls-Royce end that you do of proper peer review. These are simply uh, the product of relationships we have with the London School of Economics and with Lancaster University, and we get master students' dissertations, which we commission and supervise each summer free of charge. And up they come, cheap and cheerful as they are, but having passed that academic hurdle, um, with some quite outstanding headline figures of which, uh, if, if I may quote, the one I commissioned last year from Lancaster, um, looked at the cost, as O'Neill had done and others uh, early on, following my, the one I report, I think the report I commissioned eight years ago by Thomas Weyer uh, on the same subject of the cost per ton of carbon abated through investment in family planning. 
This comes up with a figure which is much lower than anybody else's. It says that for a dollar eleven cents, you can abate a ton of carbon by investment in family planning. Now, um, w we can't see anything wrong with the paper. Um, a proper peer review might throw up some fundamental flaw. Nonetheless, it's well worth saying that although we don't claim it's more than a student project, these make striking assess uh, assertions which we would ask others to, to follow up professionally. Also, as it happens, you mentioned gorillas and um, how to conserve gorilla uh, family planning. Uh, w at Christmas, uh, we gave one of our grants from our carbon offset scheme, which uh, takes carbon offset money straight in and sends it straight out to relevant family planning programs around the world. And we funded the chimpanzee protection program on Lake Tanzania, run by our patron, Jane Goodall, who, alongside our, another of our patrons, Sir David Attenborough, are very keen, of course, obviously, on the wildlife population connection. Thank you. So that might be where we ask Bob whether you'd like to say a little bit about the biodiversity side of what you were looking at. Um, <coughs> well, <laughs> I'll go by my early comment that I'm <laughs> uh, I, I hope I understand the issue well enough. We did we did find a number of um, papers related to biodiversity, and it does seem particularly that population growth does have strong relations to biodiversity, and it's less subject to the consumption inequality gaps that uh, climate change has in that biodiversity tends to be highest in fairly high fertility and low income areas uh, such as the tropics. So that makes it both sensitive uh, for obvious reasons um, but also extremely intriguing. It also lends itself to the whole PHE argument um, and the one that I would note in relation to Kat's uh, mention of um, uh, the gorilla habitat uh, and Roger's mention of that, that whole issue is that when, um, when you set biodiversity up as something that benefits people, people want to, and you know this far mm -hmm. better than I, people take an interest in it. So around, for example, um, the gorilla habitat in Uganda, um, uh, windy impenetrable forest where uh, Ken um, Weiss visited and I visited several years earlier, and I don't know whether you've been there, but you're familiar with the story. What they did is they, they charged tourists a high amount to see the gorillas, European tourists for the most part, and they wanted to pay that money to see the gorillas. And then they told the communities around the lake, around the area, the forest, um, A, we're going to save your water uh, sheds because there's going to be forests on the slopes, and B, we're going to distribute a bunch of the revenue to these communities. If you gather in community councils, and if these councils have equal representation of women and men, this was transformative in this area. And these councils that were composed of m not necessarily equally men and women, but large proportions of women, were then given the chance to say what they wanted. And what the women in these councils wanted in Uganda, and I documented this in a PAI report many years ago, was among other things they wanted primary health and family planning. So there was this nice connection that brought all this together through a story, <laughs> and we had some lovely pictures from it. And um, I think that's, that is a positive illustration of the way uh, family planning can benefit biodiversity. Great. Hi, my name is Simone Walter. I'm from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and thank you for all of our panelists who've spoken. Um, these questions are really for any of you, but to what extent has your research and or the peer-reviewed re research that you've looked at um, connect these issues involving reproductive health and family planning to not only environmental sustainability, but specifically environmental justice? Thank you. Environmental justice. I'm definitely not a researcher. Students have known stuff. Well, I'll say something, and then I bet Kat will have a word whether she's a researcher or not. Um, in <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't oh, so. That wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, Yes, we do. We have one piece that I would recommend to you on environmental justice, and we had to actually wrestle with the question, is environmental justice, how does environmental justice relate to environmental sustainability? But it's in, in the section, we, we, our annotations are divided into several sections, one of which is biodiversity, one of which relates to, we just call it women, relates to women's lives. But it was a study based on focus groups of women in Appalachia, uh, particularly women who were in coal mining districts, 
and who were really stepping up to fight the coal companies uh, for what they were doing to their watersheds in their areas. And it is a tremendously moving, uh, individual stories I might point out, for, particularly for Kat's benefit, great quotes from women trying to figure out why were women standing up and men weren't? Because it was primarily women who were joining these activist groups. They were overwhelmingly driven by women, although they had some men in them, and the men gave interesting interviews too. We were only able to quote a little bit. But women told the stories about their children being freaked out at night and waking up in the middle of the night and putting on their galoshes when they went to bed because they were being flooded regularly. And the women were saying in these focus groups, you know, we knew this was our future. These were our children. We had to stand up. And men were more inclined to say, hey, if I don't have a job, we're not going to be able to feed our kids. So there was this sort of gender difference that we found quite interesting. Now, does that relate to environmental sustainability? Well, I, I would argue yes. I think environmental justice is a key part of sustainability. We can't have sustainability without justice. It's not going to, it doesn't, it, it isn't a world that makes sense for the, on the one hand. And the other thing that's important is the same kind of gender differences, and one really hesitates to, to generalize about gender differences. There's a continuum, obviously, of gender. Um, and some of it's cultural, and some of it probably does relate to reproduction, who knows. But those same differences probably affect the way women approach uh, their activism in multiple aspects of environmental policy, environmental governance, environmental sustainability, and consumption behavior. So I, we, did, we did treat that, and I, I'm not able to find it immediately, but if you look in the women's section, I forget the name of the authors, two women, I believe, who did focus groups of women in Appalachia. You'll find a, a really good case study on that. Hmm. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned Appalachia because it is one of the areas in this country that has barriers to access to family planning. And it has major environmental justice uh, issues. And uh, we've actually done a fair amount of work there that isn't related to family planning, but we have also found through our own, uh, we didn't do the, the um, focus groups, but we, we had a partner who did, uh, that did find some of these gender differences in the way that they are thinking about the future of the region and, and the future that they envision for their children in the region. And the space that they have to be part of that decision making and part of those conversations is dependent in part on whether or not they have access to um, basic health services, to reproductive health services, um, Appalachia is a region in which an enormous number of children are being raised by their grandparents and not their biological parents. Um, there are major implications in there uh, in terms of who is involved in decision making about the future of that region. Um, and these are things that are hard to capture in the data. I think that they'd be hard to capture regardless of what level of peer review you were looking at. And I'll just give one more example. And I. It's, I think it's from Guatemala, and somebody in the room might remember, but there's a, there's a project down there uh, that has worked to ensure that access to reproductive health is closer to the communities, to some of these rural communities, so that they don't have to travel for a day to, to access contraception, for example. And what they have found there is that women then have more time to get involved in land rights issues and land conservation issues. It's really about the time. And that is not something that I think has been peer reviewed and it's also not something that is brought up generally in a lot of the literature because it's not intended to be about population dynamics. It's intended to be about empowerment of women to be involved in environmental decision making, and that's a very different paradigm. And I'm and I'm very grateful that one of the uh, one of the hypotheses that the Fapesa report looks at is about women's empowerment and not just population dynamics, because I think that's a crucial place for us to have these conversations. Let me just add, I did find it, and so I want to give it to you. It's on page 65 of the report. Shannon Elizabeth Bell and Yvonne A. Brown. Coal Identity and the Gendering of Environmental Justice Activism in Central Appalachia. Um, a key point, and, and uh, Kat kind of touched on it, but I want to I stress it and give it a little bit of a different twist, is that while we were going for empirical and quantitative research where we could, that's sort of the gold standard, kind of like peer review, um, and yet hard to do in social science research, 
We looked at focus groups, and frankly, focus groups are a kind of nice middle area that I think bring Cat and me together to some extent, <laughs> which is nice, um, in that you, you can number, you know, you have got some quantitative analysis you can do. You can, how many people were basically on one side of an issue or how many on the, on the other? And we found focus groups were very, very effective, and a number of our, our reports are based on focus groups, and this is one. The quotes from this were really, really incredible. And I think some, there is some research. We didn't find terribly compelling research, but I think there's been some uh, looking at the uh, time trade-offs for women and men and how, and, and, and uh, Alaka touched on this as well. For the kinds of work that women do and the kind of work that, m that men do in relation to childbearing and how that affects their interest in family planning and things of that kind. W one point I should add too is that, you know, we, we, we had to do various cutoffs. So we chose peer review and not everybody's happy about that. Uh, we chose really quantitative, and so we missed some more qualitative research. The other thing we did is we had a cutoff of 2005, and one of the things I found in reading the reports was that there was fantastic literature from before 2005 that I wanted to look at, but it was like, hey, that's where we got to have a cutoff somewhere. And so I think that some of the research that Kat and uh, Alaka and I are talking about probably was done. I mean, Tom's been in this uh, field for 37 years, uh, he tells me. Um, and, you know, a lot of good research, I'm sure, in your field, you would agree. If you mm -hmm. said to limit sure. yourself to the last 10 years or 12 years, you'd miss a lot of great stuff that went on. So we clearly are not capturing the whole range of what's going on. One final question, and then I'll drop the ball. You know, did we get, were there just 939 papers published in the last 10 years related to this? We don't really have any idea. We did the best uh, search terms we could. We worked very hard to get this. But I, we did do one test that was encouraging, which is that every time we read an article, when we saw a citation in that article that was from our time period, we looked in our database to see whether we had it in our database, if the title suggested it was really relevant. And more than half the time we did. So I think I can guess that, uh, that it, we, we roughly, I don't know, Yen, whether you would agree with this, we talked about this a little bit, we think we probably got about at least half of what's out there. So it's at least broadly representative of what's there. Great. Hi, my name is Sharon Guinup. I'm a fellow here at the Wilson Center. Um, you know, I, I tend to look at issues from a, a solutions-based uh, approach. So I wonder if, if um, any of you have any thoughts on what it will take, you know, globally to address, you know, population, you know, cultural, religious barriers, you know, funding, both domestic and international and nonprofit, you know, birth control, education, um, availability, policy changes. I mean, I, you know, we've talked a lot about ideas, and I guess I'm just, I, I'd love to hear some comments about what it's really going to take to to make this a reality? <laughs> well, I, I have one uh, strong opinion on this. I think that uh, uh, it's important to meet the unmet need for family planning, So we and there is a large demand. So we do certainly need to focus on uh, uh, on media, on family planning or other f uh, forms of access to uh, contraception when women uh, very clearly would rather no not have another child or not have another, another child right now. But I think there's also a case, given all that this other stuff that we know, uh, there is a case to be made to create a, an increased demand for family planning. So not just to meet the unmet need, but really take it one step further and think about what are the conditions under which we might increase the level of demand. And to me, the magic bullet, which in the 80s everyone talks about, but we don't really give enough importance to anymore, is education. Education has such a strong link with uh, a whole lot of things connected, not just with women's empowerment, but women's aspirations, their dreams, their uh, abilities, their information, everything that uh, I think if we did, if we left our family planning uh, uh, services at their current level and increase the level of education, I think you'd find a huge spike in unmet need. And that's why I, in fact, don't see the figures on unmet need that we see from different parts of the world as something as a sign of failure, 
to me, they're a sign of success that we've created an unmet need because we've done these other things. And so the next step is to meet the need. So when we look at countries and classify them as poor performers because unmet needs levels are high, in fact, it might be the other way around, that the unmet need has risen because we've done some of the other things that go into creating a demand for family planning. And to me, education, even more than economic activity from the literature that I've read, I'm sure everyone doesn't agree with me, but I think education matters more than economic empowerment if there is to be this demand for family planning. I just Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. I just add to that, uh, the, the kind of education that is needed and the kind of um, breaking through barriers to increase access to family planning is different in, in every single place. So there is no silver bullet. There is no one size fits all solution. But there are amazing, innovative approaches. Uh, again, this is from Latin America, uh, telenovelas featuring successful women, happy women with smaller family sizes have mm -hmm. coincided with a, an increased demand for contraception and a reduced family size. Telenovelas, I mean, who would have thought? Um, when I was in Ghana a couple of years ago, um, we, heard, uh, we heard advertisements on the radio. There were weekly programs about um, dispelling mythology of, around contraception and what it really, um, what it really meant, did, and and just trying to myth bust. So there, so there are different solutions in different places. Um, but I do think pointing out data like uh, the the one that Bob mentioned earlier about the f the number of researchers who are suggesting that population dynamics are going to have more impact on water uh, demand and water access uh, than climate change is really important. It's pointing that out and then coupling that with locally focused solutions. If I can just say something on that Go too. Um, uh, maybe a couple points. Um, I myself am, am a little wary of the word solution. Um, these, are, these are what's called wicked problems, if you understand what wicked problems are. I, I think that's a really evocative adjective, but it's a little hard to understand. Wicked problems are not evil, they're just, maybe they are, but they're <laughs> just really incredibly hard to fix. And to some extent, they might not be really fixable. And population clearly ranks in that area. If, if, we, if we adopt the attitude that we need to fix population, we're probably not in a very healthy place. I think we'd all agree there, there's something problematic about that. But if you think of uh, an author I admire, John Michael Greer, says he said this in reference to climate change or the possibility of social collapse resulting from climate change. This may not be a problem we can solve, but it's a predicament that we can respond to. So I think we need to sort of lower our, our, our sights a little bit to how we can respond to the situation that we face. And in that regard, I think there are several responses beyond improving access to family planning. And I actually wrote a chapter in, I think, the 2010 State of the World that World Watch put out that has been since republished recently by Routledge in another book altogether called Nine Ways to Stop Short of Nine Billion. And it was just a cute little idea for a title. But then I had to think of nine ideas for, for not getting to nine billion people. And, um, and they, they, I was able to do it. But a lot of it had to do with education. Clearly, education is very important, although people argue about whether it matters more than, climate, than, uh, than, than access to family planning. But also, specifically, sexuality education. And the 2017 edition of State of the World is going to be about education for surviving the 21st century. And we're, I'm co-writing a chapter on sexuality education, which is a bit of a new topic for me, with the UNFPA's expert on sexuality education. We need to teach people about their bodies. But we also need some other things, too. And one of the things I think we need, and I think Kat and I do differ in this regard, is a much stronger sense of urgency by the, by the world's policymakers about how serious this issue is and how it contributes to things like forced migration, conflict, as well as environmental problems. And in that sense, I, I think Kat, Kat and I do have a difference that I think is a really important one in this whole field. And a lot of us, there may be a gender aspect to it even, I feel, and just my own feeling. This idea that it should be enough that because it's right, we should be able to do family planning. We shouldn't have to use these other arguments. And I would argue that one of the reasons the UNFPA is now short of money to satisfy the unmet need for contraception of governments. Governments have asked, asked the United Nations Population Fund for what amounts to, I think it's 120 
million dollars for contraceptives around the world. And because donors are pulling in their money, particularly Nordic donors who, are, who say, we're dealing with a wave of refugees, we don't have the money to support your request. And as a result, somebody's nose is being cut off despite a face in, in what's happening here. And I believe that one can approach these problems with multiple arguments to raise the sense of urgency. Not enough of the policymakers of the world want to provide family planning because it is a human right and because it is the right thing to do. They need more arguments. And as long as those arguments don't undermine the fundamental human right that I talked about in my perspective, I think they're fair to present. So for me, and this is a tricky thing when you're trying to present a scientific, you know, unbal unbiased, balanced argument, but to try to convey that there is urgency to these problems and that family planning is very likely to be able to address them, but it certainly has to be coupled with education, with the right environmental policies, and with uh, go a government sense that this is something that should be done. So that almost is a great way to start uh, rolling up the end of this remarkable afternoon. Uh, and I wonder, uh, Kat, would you like to respond to that? Well, I'd actually like to violently agree with Bob. Big <laughs> hug, <laughs> group hug here. Group hug, yes. Uh, I, we like to lead, we think it's important to lead with, with the fact that access to contraception, access to family planning, reproductive health, and rights should be a fundamental human right. But we also completely agree that we need multiple arguments for multiple audiences. Um, I, uh, I was in Ghana, actually, because I was doing trainings for IPCC authors uh, for the last, um, the last assessment on how to best convey the urgency and the impact of their research around climate change to the people in a position to make a difference. And these were all um, African scientists, and they have a very different relationship with policymakers than scientists do in the U.S. Uh, and they needed to be able to think about the arguments that they could make to the Minister of Agriculture in their country for taking urgent action now. And one of the things that we taught them and one of the things that we teach everyone uh, when we do trainings like that is that you have to think about your audience and what do they care about. And if your audience cares about water, then that data point about the uh, importance of population dynamics for water is crucial. And if your audience cares about human rights, then maybe that is not the fact to lead with. But I completely agree, I violently agree, Bob, that we need multiple arguments for multiple audiences. That's great. Alaka? Uh, nothing specific. I agree with everything. I'm, I, the main thing is actually I'm delighted with this report, so I hope everyone's going to read uh, it. I just wanted to add to your thing about the, uh, the telenovelas and things like that. Actually, yes, the data, the data do actually show us that besides education, the, sec uh, the single largest uh, influence on people's uh, at least contraceptive behavior seems to be exposure to the mass media. So uh, if you ask, uh, so, that, uh, so there's nothing inconsistent in uh, what we're saying. Last word, Bob? Oh my gosh, I think I've had a lot of last words, so I'm <laughs> not sure I, much more needs to be said, but um, I, I did want to say I had noticed that Sam Sellers was in the room, uh, so we have a, a, well, a good representation of our assessment group with Alaka and Sam, and I don't know where do we have any others, and I hope some of them are, are watching on the web as an international group. But this really was a, a, uh, an incredibly fascinating way to spend my time um, working with a, uh, a group of international people very interested, very knowledgeable on these topics. And, you know, I think the, 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 the issue of evidence is just, it can help, you know? It can help, it can, it can, it can be the basis for storytelling. Um, you know, when your doctor tells you that the chances are good that you've got a particular disease, you don't necessarily need a story from your doctor. You want to know, you know, what you should do about that. So there's some cases that where evidence and data is really critical. There are other cases clearly with a lot of audiences, and I think Kat and I basically are in agreement on this, where you need to be able to tell stories. Uh, but it's wonderful when you can do both. And I'm, I'm, I'm just pleased that we were able, after quite some effort, to pull together. What I was sort of scared during this process. Is that what are we going to find? What can we really say? It's not an open and shut case. And social science is messy. You know, you're combining 
what happens to people with what happens to ge uh, geological and bio biological sorts of things, and it's, it's not easy to do. Um, but I ultimately came out very excited. I think it's a, a beautiful report, frankly. Uh, I want to give credit to ProGraphics, our designer. Um, it came out on time. We're a little bit afraid that that wouldn't happen. The uh, PDF is up. I want to thank uh, Gail Gormelon of World Watch, who I think is still here. Um, thank you. There's Gail in the background. See her if you want more information about the dissemination of the report. And she and actually Kat and I will be working on, on that issue together. Um, but I'm just delighted we were able to do it. I'm, as I said, really delighted and grateful to Roger Mark and his crew for bringing us together. I'm really pleased that Tom Lovejoy came came here from his lovely digs uh, that I've been able to visit in uh, in, uh, in uh, on a Colonial Road in Virginia uh, to uh, to moderate. And I also want to thank the United Nations Foundation, uh, the Turner Foundation, and the Wallace Global Fund for funding this incredibly important research and being very patient about its completion. And to thank you all for being interested to come out here today and my, my fellow speakers as well. So That's great. Thank and you. Roger Mark. <laughs> The oh, and my wife, Colleen Cordes, who's in the room and was about as helpful as anybody else in seeing <laughs> me through this. So. And we are, reception is up one floor in the dining room. So see you there. <laughs>